Hey everybody, and welcome to another Learning Statistics with Jamovi video. How do I do a one-way ANOVA, but instead of independent groups, I have a within subjects variable, that is repeated measurements of the same person. That's what we're doing in this video today. Thank you so much for joining me on this video. We are going to be doing a repeated measures ANOVA, repeated measures ANOVA. And in this particular video, we are only gonna have one, one repeated measures variable, just to keep it simple, 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 super simple, silly. Now, whenever you do a repeated measures ANOVA, there's only one module that you are allowed to do. And we're gonna go through that in Jamovi. Before we get started, we gotta open up some data. And I also gotta let you know that we're using the most current Mac version of Jamovi 2.3.3. Wonderful. Okay. So let's open up some data. As I said, we are using an SPSS book in, in, in other videos. I'm, I'm sort of following a guide um, that is a companion guide for using SPSS with Beth Morling's research methods in psychology textbook. Now, the data that I'm using, however, is from another textbook. This one is the free text from Danielle Navarro and uh, Foxcroft about how to use Jamovi while also learning statistics. So we're gonna be using that and that's because their data is freely available. You just go to the modules and add the LSJ hyphen data. Let's open up some data um, so you can see what I mean. So it, it appears in the data library and it's just this, it's just called this, it's really great. And the cool thing is, is that it's, it's color coded and categorized. So you know exactly which one to do. And um, because we already talked about doing a one-way repeated measures ANOVA, we're gonna be using the Broca's aphasia. Broca's aphasia. Why couldn't he say it? Anything doctor? I don't know, I think his brain was Broca. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we opened up that data. Again, Broca's aphasia is the data set that we are using. If you'd like to follow along, please choose that one. Okay, we only have six people in this particular data set, but it's fine. And the reason why it's fine is because repeated measures or paired samples or any kind of within groups or within subject variables is pretty powerful. And what I mean by powerful is that we need fewer people to be able to um, have the power to detect an effect in this kind of sit situation, this kind of design, this kind of setup. So that's why six people, not a big deal. We do have three variables. Let me go ahead and open them up for you. So we have the first variable, which is their speech score. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna change these. I'm gonna double click on the header there. And I'm gonna change these to um, continuous because they technically are continuous variables. Um, they're just integers. And as you can see here, the data type is integer, okay? So I'm gonna change that. So we have participant, I'm gonna leave that alone. Participants one through six, it's fine. Um, and then I'm gonna click this arrow that will take me to the right and it'll allow me to change the conceptual score that they got. So this is a speech score on a test, um, I believe out of 10. Okay, a conceptual score, uh, I believe out of 10. Um, so being able to understand conceptual language. Okay, so speech, saying things, conceptual, understanding, and then syntax, putting it all together. Oh, I double clicked on that. You can see that or you can do this, right? You can use these arrows, you can double click on them. It's fine. All right, so and then a, a syntax score, which I also believe is out of 10. Okay, so you can see here we have six patients who may have had some brain traumas, maybe a stroke, maybe a massive concussion, maybe encephalitis of some kind, viral or bacterial, which caused damage or pressure in the brain, which caused some potential damage to Broca's area. Broca's area is in the lateral, the left lateral ventral, oh, we'll call it the prefrontal cortex. It's somewhere around there. Um, so the left side of the frontal lobe and it coordinates speech with your primary and premotor cortexes. So it allows you to say things, what I'm saying right now. And with people, people with uh, Broca's aphasia, moderate or severe, end up having difficulty saying things. So that's what these tests are meant to determine, whether or not they have Broca's aphasia or some other kind of deficit. So we are going to see if there is a difference between these three variables, speech, conceptual, and syntax, for Broca's aphasia in these six people, whether or not they're having difficulty, okay? And where that difficulty might be in saying things, whether or not the saying is good, is determined by syntax, and then being able to understand conceptual language. Of course, that is conceptual there. So we're gonna see whether or not these six people um, are displaying Broca's aphasia. The idea here is that we expect to see errors in syntax. That is, their scores for syntax much lower than their ability to say things or their ability to understand things that have been said to them. Okay, so we are going to use 
repeated measures ANOVA. That was a lot of background, but I teach about it pretty much every year. So I, <laughs> I know a lot about this particular form of aphasia. Um, and uh, it's it's rather interesting. So I just I just you have to you have to stop me when I talk, start talking about this. It's not even my area of research. It's just very fascinating. OK, so to do a repeated measures ANOVA in any kind of repeated measures ANOVA, this particular one, we're only doing one way. So I only have one independent variable. And these people have been measured on levels of that independent variable. We can characterize our DV as an understanding score or some kind of, of accuracy score or some kind some kind of relatively similar scale uh, score. They have it has to be because this is our dependent variable. So we go up to ANOVA. And we have to do repeated measures ANOVA. Of course, that's what we're doing, but I'll explain why we have to use the repeated measures ANOVA uh, module for any ANOVA, any analysis of variance that requires at least one repeated measures, right? So in this particular case, we um, are only have one variable, and so we don't need to worry about anything else. But in, in case you were to do a factorial ANOVA, that is multiple uh, independent variables, two or more independent variables that are connected and that are crossed and interacting, you have to use this module to do that. Now, if you only had between subjects or independent group variables for your factorial, then you can use another module. But if one of them is repeated measures, you have to use this module. OK, so let's head. And the reason and the reason why, as you can see, that is right here between subject factors and, and, and other things that go in here. But it's a pretty, pretty uh, robust module. First thing I want to do before I set anything is I want to name my dependent variable. And I'm just going to uh, label this as accuracy score. OK, the only reason why I do this is because when we do plots, when we do plots, it's going to be on the plot itself. And I think it's important to know. It's important to know that. OK, back up here. This is where your repeated measures goes. You label them in the top here, repeated measures factors. You label them here. And then you put your variables in the cells here. OK, so by default, the repeated measures module wants you to have at least two levels. So you have to do what's um, darker black here. But and then by option, you will have a third level. And then once you write in third level, these are sort of grayed out because they are options. Or you can have a second RM factor. RM just stands for repeated measure. So RM factor one, this is going to be subtest. OK, because these are all subtests of Broca's aphasia's full battery. So these are subtests. So level one, we're going to label as speech. And you might think to yourself, Dr. Swan, why are you labeling him when you have them right there? Well, that's because I want to make sure speech ends up with speech, conceptual ends up with conceptual, and syntax ends up with syntax. And this is important when you have multiple RM factors. You want to be as descriptive with your labels as possible. And, and this is 100% optional. But I, I recommend it. You don't have to do this. I could have just grabbed all three and, and, and put them in here. OK, so just be aware of that. I always like labeling my things. And you can see that speech goes down here in the bottom, conceptual down here. And as, as soon as I start uh, typing here, syntax, um, and then hit enter, it's going to it's going to say, oh, you need a level. F you can you can add a level four in now if you'd like. And it also gives me an X button to cancel this if I really needed to, like if I made a mistake or something, because the module only requires. And of course, all comparisons require at least two things to compare. So you can't get rid of these two, but you can get rid of this one. And if, if I added in a fourth one or if I added in an RM factor two, it'll come up with an with, it'll come up with an X symbol here so that I can cancel that because the only things that are required are these first three rows. OK, so we have speech, conceptual and syntax all in the same order that I did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click speech, hold shift and click on syntax. So it grabs all three and then I'm just going to click the arrow and it's going to put them all in order, which is perfect. That's all I want it to do. OK, and it's going to give me my basic setup here, which is the within subjects effects. This is my repeated measures variable of subtest. OK, and so it's going to give me information here. Now, I don't have any between subjects factors, so independent groups factors here. So it's just giving me the residual for that. That was partialed away uh, in the uh, formulation of the within subjects. So this is not necessarily important except for error that I needed to take out of this particular source table here. OK, so we're going to ignore this table for now. We'll talk about it in, a, in another video where we do a mixed model, for example. OK, let's talk about these options. We've already um, labeled my uh, dependent variable again, accuracy score. That's going to appear in the plot. Now, I mentioned in a previous video, but if you haven't watched that video, we have three effect size options. We have generalized um, eta squared, eta squared, and partial eta squared. I'm going to select all three, and I'm going to tell you why I've selected all three and what it means to choose each of these. OK, let's go through the options. The model. We already have the model term set up properly here, and we have no between subjects components, so we're, that's blank. Sums of squares is type 3. For bias correction, we would type, uh, use type 2. There is no type 1 for repeated measures ANOVAs, so we would use type 2 for that. Um, I don't expect us to have any violations of any assumptions, so we don't need to worry about bias correction in the variance. Now, for assumption checks, for between subject variables, we would want to get homogeneity of variance. Um, we don't have any, so clicking on this gives us a not available or not applicable. Some not apl I forgot what NAN stands for, but um, 
but it tells you as there are no between subject factors specified in the assumption, this assumption is always met. So we can ignore that one and uncheck it. The other one that we do need to focus on, though, is the Mockley's test of sphericity. Sphericity is the association of these three levels and whether or not they are related to one another. Perhaps we don't want them to be too related to one another because then there's an autocorrelation issue. Um, we're not assessing any differences if there's an autocorrelation between these measurements. Too high of an autocorrelation. An autocorrelation being equal to one. Okay, so we want to grab our sphericity test and it'll pop up as Mockley's W. Okay, and um, now sphericity corrections. None is on by default, as you can see here. But if I checked out the Greenhouse Geyser or the Hewn Felt, this will add in two additional rows to my source table and it will be adjusting my degrees of freedom, which tells the adjustment of the P value. Okay, so the P value is, so you can see the F is the same for all three, right? 6.93, but you can see the Greenhouse Geyser changes it to 1.74. Um, so the greenhouse geyser uh, changes the both the um, uh, degrees of freedom for the numerator and the denominator, whereas the hewn felt doesn't do anything because it's equal to one. So it everything's the same. Um, so it didn't. I would I'm just gonna uncheck that one. Greenhouse geyser is eight point uh, eight six eight. This is the change in um, the degrees of freedom. So that's the value uh, of reduction. So the bias correction in the degrees of freedom. So less degrees of freedom, which is going to change the p value based on what my f statistic is. Okay, and you can see that it's a literal translation of the degrees of freedom because we have ten in our um, non correction and eight point six eight, which is times ten. There you see. It's it's so it's a multiplier value. And so Hume's, Hume Felt's epsilon, these are both epsilon. Hume Felt and Greenhouse Geyser epsilons. Hume Felt is one, and so that didn't change the degrees of freedom at all. Not, not useful. We don't need Greenhouse Geyser, though, and that's because the p-value of this sphericity test is 0.72, which means we haven't violated sphericity. We're good. These, these um, measurements are independent enough. And so we don't need to worry about that. So I, for the sake of reducing the amount of clutter in tables, I'm going to uncheck that. Okay, postdoc tests. Now, postdoc tests is similar to a one-way ANOVA in that we need to bring subtest over to find out whether or not it is syntax that is the problem with these Broca's aphasia patients. Because we do know that there is a difference among the three subtests. We have an F of 6.93 and a p-value of 0.013. So the postdoc tests are going to tell us where that difference is. Now, um, in the previous video, I did Tuki and Chaffe and uh, Bonferroni. I wanted to get all of them. Again, if you pre-registered these pairwise comparisons, you can do no correction. Just to show you what no correction looks like for these things, those are the p-values when we don't correct. And so if you did not, if you did not pre-register the pairwise comparisons, then you shouldn't be doing no correction because you do have to do post hoc corrections to the p-value. OK, uh, marginal means we're going to go ahead and grab subtest and we're going to put it into uh, term one. We're going to get our standard errors and we're going to get our marginal mean tables. It's great. There it is. And these are our marginal means. OK, oh, you can see here that something's fishy. And the other options you can get is the group summary. The group summary um, it really only tells you uh, how many N you have and how many people were excluded. We're going to uncheck that because we don't need those options. So let's close all of that. So there we go. This is the output for this is the output for. Repeated measures ANOVA, one way ANOVA. We only have one variable, one dependent variable. Okay, let's take a look at, so we, we, we stated that this is a significant ANOVA. And so we're gonna go to the postdoc test, but let's take a look at these three effect sizes. We have our generalized eta squared, we have our eta squared, and then we have a partial eta squared. So you can see that generalized and eta squared are the exact same values, 0.414. But partial eta squared is 0.581. Why are they different? Well, 0.581 is assuming that um, these three subtests are fully independent of one another. And so it's actually not an accurate effect size. It's an inflated effect size. It's um, saying the effect size is bigger than it actually is because it thinks you are doing an independent or between subject group variable. And you don't want that. You would use partial eta squared in this box, in this table between subjects effects. So we don't, we're, we're going to ignore it in this one. Now we can see that the uh, eta squared and the uh, generalized eta squared are the exact same as I said. Now we only have one variable. So eta squared is going to be eta squared regardless. Okay. Generalized eta squared is a replacement for omega squared for repeated measures ANOVAs, for repeated measure designs. Generalized eta squared is a newer statistic for effect size that mirrors eta squared, but it's appropriate for repeated measure designs. So if we were to report the effect size, we would say, you know, F is equal, F2 comma 10 equal to 6.93 comma P is equal to 0 0.013 comma uh, eta squared G with a capital G. For, or you can write the word generalized in front of eta squared, is equal to 0. 0.414. The good news is, is that they all have the same uh, interpretation. They are R squared 
in many respects. They're the percent of variance um, that is shared or explained by, uh, uh, of the dependent variable by this set of levels of the independent variable. So about 41% in the change in accuracy scores is explained by these three subtests. And you can imagine that the effect itself, I forgot to get, oh, you don't get um, effect size in this module. That's, that's a bummer. Anyway, um, you don't get your Cohen's D here, although I think it's because Cohen's D is a, um, they haven't set it up from the paired samples t-test to be the correct one for the paired samples here, the pairwise comparisons of so these are essentially paired sample t-tests that are occurring as opposed to independent samples t-tests. So you don't get the effect size here for the Cohen's D, but at least you have a, an understanding that, okay, 41% of the change of scores is being um, explained uh, by these three subtests. And what's that subtest that is really showing the deficit? Well, it's the syntax score. And you can look at speech compared to conceptual. Speech compared to conceptual is not significant, okay? Speech compared to syntax is also not significant, although it's getting there it's getting there i think there's some overlap with conceptual and, and, and syntax um and well there's definitely with that uh, it, it could be that the standard errors are just slightly too big in this example i think my, what might help in this example is if there were more than six six people there are more than six people the point is though that even though the post hoc comparisons do not show although let's see if we do no correction yes the speech to syntax is significant 0.026 oh and conceptual to syntax is also significant just barely 0.048 or 0.05 if you prefer to round up. And you can see that if we adjust our p-values, they get adjusted upward. And um, we don't really know. It's trending that syntax is, is the difficulty here. But of course, no correction is showing us that, yeah, it is syntax because the two comparisons with syntax are less than 0.05. Only, only, again, only if you've pre-registered these pairwise comparisons. Technically, I did <laughs> in this video. But, you know, regardless of that, you would want to make sure that you have the right stuff here depending on what you have decided to do. So let's say you did the ANOVA and you're like, I don't know what I'm expecting here. And you did the ANOVA and you got a significant ANOVA and you're like, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, um, the generalized uh, ADA, uh, partial ADA squared is pretty high or it's a medium, uh, medium effect. No, no, that's really high. Um, and then you come here and you're like, wait, post hoc test, that's, that's strange. That, I don't, that, that shouldn't be like that. That's, I don't, I don't get that. Well, you'd have to say that. And I think part of the thing that you would say in the, uh, in the, in the results is that you only had six patients. Maybe a seventh patient following the same pattern of results here would give you a little bit more information. A lot of times it always, it, it, a lot of times it does come down to um, how many participants you have. Just ask my research methods and stats students from this last semester. <laughs> last semester being spring 2022 if you're watching this far into the future. All right, so that is how you do a one-way repeated measures ANOVA in Jamovi using the repeated measures ANOVA module. If you have any comments, suggestions, or feedback, please leave those down below. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you next time. Toodles.